Well, tonight we're going to start the book of Judges. And I'd like to suggest some headlines that you might be interested in. One headline says, Family feud leaves 69 brothers dead. Another headline says, Powerful government leader caught in love nest. Another headline says, Gang rape leads to victims' death and dismemberment. Another one reads, Girls at party kidnapped and forced to marry strangers. And uh, one more, The woman judge says travelers no longer safe on highways. Now this sounds like they are been excerpted from supermarket tabloids, doesn't it? But uh, Warren Wearsby opens his commentary on the book of Judges, suggesting that these headlines characterize some of the events of the book. You know, we're going to see, in, enter a book that has adult content. I'm tempted to hold up some kind of play card saying, uh, you know, uh, uh, nudity and violence and what have you, like they always do on some of these rated movies. I don't think there's any foul language, but it's going to get pretty rough. It's pretty much an adult book. And frankly, uh, you would be hard-pressed to find a book on the bookshelves that uh, has more color or intrigue in it. You'll probably wince when you see Ehud uh, who goes to visit the king in a summer palace and slides his dagger between his fifth and sixth ribs so the flesh closes so tightly he can't get it out. You'll probably cringe when you say, see Yael uh, drive a tent stake through the skull of Sisera and pins him to the ground. And uh, you'll probably bite your fingernails along with all of us as Gideon with Gideon, as God uh, introduces military cutbacks like you wouldn't believe, reducing Israel's army from 32,000 to 300, and then sends this vastly outnumbered, I won't call it an army, it's a squad practically, uh, into battle. And you'll probably be very troubled when you see Jephthah's daughter who comes out to meet him on his return from battle, and he remembers his hasty vow to sacrifice the first person he met. And he fulfills that dreadful vow. On the one hand, you'll glory with Samson as he wreaks havoc among the Philistines, and yet you will ponder his folly as he allows this Philistine uh, temptress to uh, worm the secret out of him for his strength. And you'll obviously turn your stomach at the, in revulsion in the story of the Benjamite perversion that marks the, perhaps the darkest chapter in Israel's history. So... Uh, Anyway, I don't know what kind of books you read, but if you um, are interested in romance or um, military history, soap operas, conspiracy theories, spy novels, swashbuckling adventure, or political intrigue, you'll find it all in the book of Judges. But from a broader or deeper perspective, what we're really going to be experiencing here is a deteriorating nation. And one of the shocks that really came home to me as I was preparing for this series is how it is a timely and yet sober warning to us right now in this time. The book of Judges is, could be titled, No King. See, the first of Samuel, which follows it, will be man's king, Saul, and then second Samuel will be uh, God's king, David. But we're now in this strange place where there's no king, and that's going to be a key theme throughout the whole thing. The world today uh, is living in the book of Judges because there's no king in Israel. That's a key fact. It's interesting, when, they, when Israel was presented their rightful king, they proclaimed, we have no king but Caesar. Well, the next king on the agenda will be the world's king, the Antichrist. Then God's king will appear, defeat his enemies and establish his kingdom. I might mention, in, mention incidentally that the book of Ruth is the bright spot in this period of history. It's a separate book, of course, but it occurs in the period of the Judges. It's a story of love, of harvest. I think the, the world is living in the book uh, of the book of Judges. We'll watch that. We should be living in the book of Ruth, sharing the harvest and waiting for the wedding. The book of Joshua that just precedes this book closes with the nation resting from a war of conquest. But we're going to discover that uh, the sequel... The war of occupation is a disaster. Uh, We'll see the nation suffering from invasion, slavery, poverty, and war. 
And why? What happened? Book of Joshua, which just precedes this, is a book of seven years of conquest, and they completed their basic mission. But we'll discover painfully they didn't really complete it. The follow-through, the completion of their victory um, was a disaster. They failed to do what they were supposed to do. And what they were supposed to do is shocking. It'll disturb us as we get into this. The boundary lines for the 12 tribes, of course, had been determined, but they didn't fully occupy. And uh, so they, they didn't claim their inheritance. They needed to claim their inheritance by defeating and uh, dislodging the entrenched inhabitants. This even shows up in the book of Joshua. You may recall when we were in chapter 13, it opens up with the following verse. Now Joshua was old and stricken in years, and the Lord said unto him, Thou art old and stricken in years, and there remaineth yet very much land to be possessed. When we read that in Joshua, it doesn't hit us as hard until we get into the book of Judges and realize just how incomplete their, their uh, conquest was. The people owned the land, but they hadn't possessed it, and therefore they couldn't enjoy it all. One of the most commonly quoted uh, uh, quotations is George Santayana's quote, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. I like the way Hegel said pretty much the same thing. History teaches us that man learns nothing from history. And uh, one of the great tragedies is that uh, we today need to really understand Judges. Judges, The book of Judges will attract us because it's very diverse in these characters that show up, all kinds, shapes, sizes, and all kinds of adventures. And yet the general tone is one of great dismay. And as we understand it, understand the dynamics undergirding it and so forth, we'll realize that it characterizes probably more than any other book in the Bible today, the world today. There are four key factors that characterize the whole book of Judges. It covers over 400 years and many, many different episodes and things, but there are four things that tie it all together. First, there is no king in Israel. That is repeated again and again, at least four times in the book. There's no king in Israel. And we're going to see the, what the penalty of an absence in leadership brings. The second characteristic of the period is that people were doing what was right in their own eyes. We read that phrase, and if you read it, you know, if everybody did what was right in their own eyes, it sounds good at first if you look at it naively. No, it's a descriptor that marks the nadir of human morality. Everyone was doing what was right in their own eyes in contrast to what God would have them do. And boy, if, that, if there's anything that characterizes our culture today is relativism. You have your truth, I have mine. We'll each do what's right in our own eyes. That is, in, in God's terms, an indictment. There's a third characteristic we'll see in the book of Judges, is that, and that is that God's people can't seem to work together. We're going to see all kinds of uh, things there. And boy, does that describe it today? They always joke that Christians make their, you know, set up their firing squads in circles. The, uh, everybody attacking everybody else, you know. And of course, the fourth characteristic, that people were in bondage uh, to their various enemies. That's the byproduct of all this. Now, the introduction to the book can best be summarized by skipping ahead, and we're going to look at the last half of chapter 2. When we've done that, we'll come and take chapter 1 as we jump into the study, but we're used to having an introduction. Uh, uh, but we're going to take as an introduction chapter 2, and we'll start about verse 8. Actually, uh, chapter 2, verses 6 to 9 connects, if you will, to Joshua 24. It really links the two books together. You can almost look at this as volume two of a two-volume set with Joshua and, uh, and uh, Judges as the, the pre-monarchy books, if you will. Anyway, Joshua 2, verse 8 says, Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died being 110 years old, and they buried him in the border of his inheritance in, in Timnath Fares, uh, sometimes called Timnath Sarah, but anyway, in the Mount of Ephraim on the north side of the hill Gash. And, there, and also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers. In other words, Joshua and all his gang, these heroes of that seven-year conquest, they ultimately pass away. And verse 10 continues, And there arose another generation after them which knew not the Lord, 
nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. So already we starting to get a, a, a cloud on the horizon here. Because what happened then? In the, verse 11, And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. Balaam is a plural for Baal. Baal is a... The term technically just means Lord, but it's used as a term for idol worship. It's a name that uh, has many variations in pagan worship. But it's principally the god of storms or the god of Mars. in has various configurations. As you understand that, you'll understand why Elijah challenged the priests of Baal for rain back in that famous confrontation. Anyway, we'll move on here. Verse 12, And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt, and followed other gods, the gods of the people that were round about them, and bowed themselves unto them, and provoked the Lord to anger. And they forsook the Lord, and they served Baal and Ashtaroth. Baal is always configured as a male god, god of war, or what have you. Uh, Ashtaroth was a female, the moon goddess, if you will, of the Phoenicians, the Ashtoreth of the Sidonians, Ishtar, if you will, of the Akkadians and the Assyrians, Astarte of the Greeks. And you'll find these references all through the scriptures. A lot of libraries are full of uh, background on these various forms of worship. She's also called the Queen of Heaven in a number of places, not the least of which is in Jeremiah 44. So these are the various false gods they took on. It's astonishing when you stand back and look at their history. God miraculously brings them out of Egypt with this dramatic series of ten plagues. They cross the Red Sea and wipe out the Egyptian army. And God for 40 years provides for them through the wilderness, one miracle after another. Then, of course, they finally enter the land and they have this seven-year campaign where they dispossess these giants and what have you, and they they do pretty well. But see, the next generation (laughs) uh, ignored all that. And we'll we'll see some of the reasons why, but basically they uh, neglected their heritage. You know, it's so tragic. It's so tragic uh, when people are beneficiaries of... uh, the heroism and sacrifice of a heritage. And then the next generation ignores it, takes it for granted, or, or, or sets it aside. And, and uh, that's certainly true in our country. You know, it's, it's stirring to read any of the, the background of the founding fathers and, and the sacrifices and, and recognize that these people in America that founded this country, they, they pledged their, their lives and their sacred honor and their wealth to knowing that uh, it would only benefit their posterity. Here we are, shrugging it off. Well, this is analogous here. They, they, there's another generation grew up after Joshua and his gang, and they, did, they knew not the Lord. And uh, so they started to pick up all the practices of the nations around them. Verse 14, And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. Boy, I can understand why. And he delivered them into the hands of spoilers that spoiled them, and he sold them into the hands of their enemies round about, so they could not any longer stand before their enemies. And whithersoever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil, as the Lord had said, and as the Lord had sworn unto them. And they were greatly distressed. In other words, God told them He's going to do this. He swore that He was going to do this, and they ignored it. Verse 16, Nevertheless the Lord raised up judges, which delivered them out of the hand of those that spoiled them. The word judges is to us kind of a misleading term. We're not talking about someone standing in court uh, adjudicating issues of law. There is a case or two of that in in the book, but that's not what the term really is intended to mean. It's really a a collective term applied to a diverse group of leaders, all from different places at different times and different circumstances, that God chose to raise up. And they're a diverse group. Uh, It's just, but when you have that whole, that concatenation of episodes that make up the book, the, the word that's, you know, translated judges is really a term that simply implies the leaders that God used in these various episodes uh, to accomplish his will. So don't think of judge in the, any kind of uh, legalistic or legislative sense. These are really just leaders that you would consider, in a, some of them in a sense just laymen, that were called upon God, by God to stand up under the situation. Well, we'll see as it goes. Verse 17. And yet they would not hearken unto their judges, but went a-whoring after their gods and bowed themselves down unto them, and they turned quickly out of the way which their fathers walked in, obeying the commandments of the Lord. 
But they did not so. And when the Lord raised them up judges, then the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of the enemies all the days of the judge. For it repented the Lord because of all their groanings by reason of them that oppressed them and vexed them. So in other words, God relieves their problems from time to time through a judge. But uh, it doesn't do much good. Verse 19, And it came to pass when the judge was dead that they returned and corrupted themselves more than their fathers in following other gods to serve them and bow down unto them. They ceased not from their own doings, nor from their stubborn way. Now, before you get too hard and visualize you those, those, those dumb Israelis, put your own feet in those shoes, because that's all of us, you know, in a sense. When the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he said, Because this, that this people hath transgressed my covenant, which I commanded their fathers, and have not hearkened to my voice, I will not henceforth drive out any from before them of the nations which Joshua left when he died. And through them I may prove Israel whether they will keep the way of the Lord to walk therein as their fathers did keep it or not. And therefore the Lord left those nations without driving them out hastily, neither delivered he them into the hand of Joshua. So you can easily label this period of time, this 410 years or whatever that we're dealing with the book of Judges as the worst of times from God's point of view. Instead of spiritual fervor, they sunk into apathy. Instead of obeying the Lord, the people moved into apostasy. Instead of enjoying law and order, the land was filled with anarchy, and we'll see some of that. As I was preparing this, I couldn't uh, help but think of the parallel to most great nations. Not long ago we were studying the cycle of nations. It's been studied many times by Toynbee, oh, well, all the uh, Jim Black, all the, uh, the number of books, classic studies. Best summarized perhaps by... Alexander Tyler of 1750, where he points out the cycle of all nations is pretty much the same. From bondage to spiritual faith, and from spiritual faith to courage, from courage to freedom, from freedom to abundance, but then abundance to complacency, and complacency to apathy, and from apathy to dependency, and from dependence back into bondage. That's the cycle. And how tragic it is. And Hegel was so right that history teaches us that man learns nothing from history. Now, one of the key verses in the book of Judges is Judges 21-25. You're going to pick a key verse. This is probably it. In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. That's the key word. It will echo again not only in 21-25, but in Judges 17-6, and Judges 18-1, and Judges 19-1, and so on. This issue of kingship deserves some study. You know, at Mount Sinai, the Lord had taken Israel to be his kingdom of priests, declaring that he alone would reign over them. That was in Exodus 19, just before the Ten Commandments was given. Moses reaffirms the kingship of Jehovah, if you will, when he explained the covenant to that new generation that they, when they're going to enter Canaan. That was in, in, in the end of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy uh, 29 and following. Then at the conquest of Jericho, Joshua declared to Israel her kingdom responsibilities in Joshua chapter 8. And he reminded them again before his death in Joshua 24. Now we're going to find even Gideon, when we get to Gideon, refute, whatever else was true, he refused to set up a royal dynasty. He says, I will not rule over you, and neither will my son rule over you. you the Lord shall rule over you. And judge, that'll be in chapter 8 when we get there. It's interesting to realize that Deuteronomy 6 outlines the nation's basic responsibilities. And there really are four. The first five verses in Deuteronomy 6 is to love and obey only Jehovah, or Yahweh, however you want to say it. The great commandment comes out of that. Jesus quotes it as the great commandment. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all the heart, soul, strength, and mind. Then verses 6 through 9, is the, it goes on with the Shema. Teach your children... God's laws. I want to ask for a show of hands of how many of you personally have taught your children God's laws. That was that's what we're supposed to do. And then Deuteronomy 6, 10 to 15, be thankful for God's blessings. Some of us do that, but certainly not completely. And the, and the rest of the, the chapter, to separate yourself from pagan worship. We may try, but we do it poorly. Now Israel had failed in each one of these responsibilities. And that's why they were plunged into moral, spiritual, and political disaster. Do you see any parallels to our land? Do you see any parallels to our own life? I think it's so dramatic, and yet at the same time, putting all this up front, 
I thought it would sharpen our attention as we go through these bizarre anecdotes and episodes and what have you. Um, strange stuff coming. But through all that, here and there, God raised up men and women who would believe him, that would confront the enemy and win the victory. And he's doing that today. The uh, book of Judges will challenge each of us to be available, no matter what's going on. God will work through his people if he can find those that will, that will trust his word, that will yield to his spirit and do his bidding, whatever it is. And the question you might think about as we go through the study is, will you be among those? Will you be among those that are available to yield to his word, to, to yield to the spirit, and to do his bidding? Well, let's just jump in. I think that's enough of a warm-up. Let's go into Judges chapter 1. The book of Judges is about the decline and fall, and we're going to discover in the first two chapters of this book that there, it's going to describe four distinct phases or stages of that fall. And the first stage is fighting the enemy. And that'll be the first 21 verses of chapter 1. Let's just look at it. Chapter 1, verse 1. Now, after the death of Joshua, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, Who shall go up for us against the Canaanites first to fight against them? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have delivered the land into his hand. Interesting. They start off all right. They're, the first thing they do is ask God. They solicit God's teaching, will, desire, whatever on the matter. And uh, God responded that Judah will go up. And it's, it's a good start. Now Judah was probably going first because he was destined to be the kingly tribe, if you remember that from Genesis 49, but that's speculation. Let's move on to verse 3. And Judah said unto Simeon his brother, Come up with me into my lot, that we may fight against the Canaanites, and I likewise will go with thee into thy lot. So Simeon went with them. The two of them, Judah and Simeon, you may recall, were blood brothers. They both had the same mother. They both were from Leah. The tribe of Simeon actually had his inheritance within the area of Judah. So that's why on many maps it's quite fuzzy in terms of what Judah is quite a large space, Simeon is a small space, but it's right adjacent or part of it. They're really, they were blood brothers and they're also close neighbors and they did a lot together all the way through. Verse 4, And Judah went up and the Lord delivered the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hands. And they slew of them in Bezek 10,000 men. And they found Adonai Bezek, Adonai being a word for Lord, and in other words, the Lord of Bezek, that's the, it's a title probably rather than a name, but in any case, they found Adonai Bezek in, in Bezek, and they fought against him, and they slew the Canaanites and the Perizzites, and Adonai uh, Bezek fled, and they pursued after him. They obviously caught him, and what did they do? <laughs> they caught him and cut off his thumbs and his big toes. Now I say, what on earth? Well, if you cut off a guy's thumb, he can't handle a bow and arrow. And if you cut off his big toe, he no longer has the footing for combat. He is no longer capable to lead in battle. Therefore, he's ineligible to rule or lead. And that seemed to be a form of dismemberment that was common in those days, as we'll find out. Verse 7, Adonai Bezek himself, he said, Three score and ten kings, in other words, seventy kings, having their thumbs and great toes cut off, gathered their meat under my table as I have done. So God hath requited me. They brought him to Jerusalem, and there he died. In other words, Adonai Bezek admits that this is retribution, because that apparently is what he did to his enemies, 70 of them. Cut off their thumbs and their big toes. Apparently a retribution took place. There are some other, a number of places where there is dismemberment uh, in the Scripture. You remember uh, Samson. What did they do to Samson? They blinded him. Remember when the Philistines finally get Samson? We'll find out when we get to Judges 13 we'll, and following. We'll get into that. And Nahash's condition for a covenant with the men of Jabesh was to t- pluck out one of their eyes. He would make a promise. I'm covenant with you if you pluck out your right eye. And uh, Zedekiah, the king, when he was conquered by Nebuchadnezzar, they killed his sons before his eyes, blinded him, carried him off to chains. Dismemberment seemed to be a common thing in the Scripture. But these 70 kings that uh, are alluded to here sort of illustrate the sad plight of anybody that's given into an enemy. If you give in, as I'm speaking spiritually, if you give in to your enemy, you cannot walk or run correctly. You cannot use your sword effectively. You, uh, you be in a place of humiliation instead of on the throne. Uh, you'll be unable to lead and uh, you'll be living on the scraps and leftovers instead of feasting at the table. That's basically the profile that's implied here. It's also the profile you and I experience spiritually, if we don't get the victory through the Spirit. 
But what a difference it makes. What a difference it makes if you live by faith and reign in your life through Jesus Christ. Romans 8, 28 through 39 summarizes that. And who can say, if God be for us, who can be against us and so on. But let's move on. Verse 8. Um, now the children of Judah had fought against Jerusalem and taken it and smitten it with the edge of the sword and, and set the city on fire. So Jerusalem was their next trophy. And although they conquered it, they didn't occupy it. And uh, that wasn't done until the time of David in 2 Samuel 5. Then it became known as the city of David and it became the national capital. It's interesting that the national capital of Jerusalem is the challenge before the world today. You know, (laughs) they've conquered it, Six-Day War, but they haven't put their enemies out. It's divided. The world is challenging Israel's right to Jerusalem, uh, just as the Jebusites did until David, until they had a king, until David came along. And Jerusalem is going to be challenged by the world until the king comes. Do you you see a parallel here at all? Blows me away. I never looked at the book of Judges, the book of prophecy, frankly. But, you know, it's interesting. The Midrash teaches us that prophecy is pattern, not just prediction. Pattern, not just prediction. Interesting. Well, next they they attack uh, south and west of Jerusalem, uh, which includes Hebron. Verse 9, And afterward the children of Judah went down to fight against the Canaanites that dwelt in the mountain and in the south and in the valley. And Judah went against the Canaanites that dwelt in Hebron. Now Hebron was before Kiriath Arba. I want to come back to that word. And they slew uh, Shishai, Ahiman, and Talmai. And you say, gee, Chuck, that's exciting. Who are those guys? <laughs> well, Kiriath Arba is, mentioned, is named, obviously, the town is named after Arba, who was the father of a guy by the name of Anak. He was a giant. His descendants are known as the Anakim. And who do you know that was a son of Anak? Goliath. He wasn't the only one. He had some brothers. There were five altogether. That's why later on in Samuel, that's why when David crosses the brook, he picks up not one stone. That's all it took for Goliath. He put in five in his bag. That kid was ready for the whole gang, not just Goliath. Whole different insight. Now, Arba is the father of Anak, and Anak is the father of Shishai, Ahiman, and Talmai. These three are sons of Anak. They're Anakim. They're giants. They killed him. And uh, these are Nephilim. In Numbers thirteen thirty three, when Joshua, excuse me, when Moses sends the twelve tribes out, ten of them come back saying, "Hey, they're giants in the land." They weren't being unreasonable. They're facing giants in the land. We are grasshoppers to their sight. Some of these guys are what? Apparently the bed was 13 feet long that they slept, one of them slept on. The Anakim, the Rephaim, the, there's a, there's four types of these all through Canaan in those days. Why? For the same reason that the fallen angels messed around creating the conditions that led to the flood of Noah. You need to understand Genesis 6. Not only to understand what really was going on with the flood of Noah, but that also happens again later, not as extensively apparently. We have to infer. We can't, it's, not, it's not that clear. That's why it's part of some confusion. The Nephilim that were the hybrids that derived from the fallen angels and, and the women that they took, those hybrids is the reason God set the flood of Noah. And that's a study of Genesis 6 you need to get comfortable with. It's, it's weird stuff. But in Genesis 6, verse 4, it says they were there and also after that. In other words, this occurred again after the flood, not as extensively apparently. But when God told Abraham in Genesis 4, 15 and then 17 that his descendants would go away for four centuries and then they would come back to inherit the land, Satan learns that he has 400 years to lay down a minefield. And that's what was populating the contaminants of his handiwork was populating the land that Joshua is called to uh, enter. When these, when these, the, the twelve tribes were sent into the land by Moses, ten of them came back terrorized by these guys. Two of them came back saying, "Hey, the Lord's on our side. Let's go get them." That was Joshua and Caleb. And uh, as you know, all those sto- all know the story how the people were 
upset, murmuring, you brought us, you brought us here to die in the wilderness, Moses. God says, no, you got it wrong. You guys are going to die in the wilderness. Your children will enter the land. So the whole first gen, that first generation that wandered in the wilderness for 40 years had to die out before God would take them into the land, except for two. There's two exceptions, Joshua and Caleb. They were the heroes, and they're the leaders then that go follow through. So when Joshua crosses the Jordan to Gilgal, he sends out two spies. He takes the biggest tribe, the toughest, the Amorites, and their capital was Jericho. That's the first one he hits. He sends in the two, uh, these two guys. We call them spies. I would call them witnesses for a lot of reasons. All they accomplished was to get Rahab saved. But anyway, that's a whole other thing. But anyway, Joshua had promised uh, Caleb, because of his faithfulness, uh, to the Lord at Kadesh Barnea, where all this, uh, that uh, his, that he would uh, have his pick, and that, uh, but his descendants didn't follow through. He would get Hebron. See, uh, Caleb got Hebron. But his descendants, too, didn't follow through, we'll discover. Hebron is still a stronghold, a fortress, for Israel's enemies today. What about Jericho? We'll come to Jericho in a little bit. Let me just leave it for now. Okay. But incidentally, faith must have run in some, in some of uh, uh, Caleb's family because the city of Debir, which is the next subject here, was taken by Othaniel, which is uh, uh, Caleb's nephew. Let's move on to verse 11. From thence he went against the inhabitants of Debir, and the name of Debir was before Kiriath Sefer. And Caleb said, He that smiteth Kiriath Sefer and taketh it, to him will I give Aksa, I guess that's the way you pronounce it, Aksa, my daughter, to wife. So Othniel, the son of Kenaz, uh, Caleb's younger brother, took it, and he gave Aksa his daughter to wife. And it came to pass when she came to him that she moved him to ask of her father a field. But apparently, uh, you know, the son-in-law wasn't as good at asking as the daughter was. So it says when she uh, lighted off her ass, Caleb said unto her, What wilt thou? And she said unto him, Give me a blessing, for thou hast given me the south land. Give me also the springs of water. And Caleb gave her the upper springs and the nether springs. See, water in that region is more precious than oil, even into, even today. The land is useless without it. Anyway, that's why she was a smart gal. She, uh, while, things were, while the getting was good, she got the, the springs that they needed to make that fruitful. Water in that very area is the major issue between Israel and Jordan, by the way. And one reason they, there's a rapprochement between them is because they've been able to get some of those things worked out between them. Verse 16, the children of, Ken, of the Kenite, Moses' father-in-law, that's a mistranslation I'll come back to, went up out of the city of palm trees with the children of Judah into the wilderness of Judah, which lieth in the south of Arad, and they went and dwelt among the people. The Kenites were descended from Moses' brother-in-law, and thus were allies of Israel. The Hebrew letters for brother-in-law or father-in-law are the same, and that helps explain a lot of problems. There's problems with the names of Ruel, Jethro, and Hobab, they're all... Uh, Moses' father, except some scholars believe that Moses' father in law had two names, Hobab and Jethro, and that Ruah was a distant relative. But it also gets more complicated because Ru- Moses had more than one wife. Now, the city of Palm, it says that in verse 16, the city of palm trees, that's an expression for a place that we know as Jericho. Bet Yerah, the house of the moon god, is where the word Jericho comes from. It's, uh, and, and of course, the city of Palms, the, the original Jericho was deserted and condemned city from Joshua 6. So the Kenites moved to another part of the land under the protection of the tribe of Judah. The ancient Jericho was predicted they would never be rebuilt, but they built a city called Jericho right next to it, Bet Yerah. And it's the capital of who? It's, in effect, the, the headquarters for the PLO to this day. Isn't it interesting how, how history is unfolding here? Because the, the, the people where Israel failed to deal with their enemies back there are the same pockets in modern history of their headaches. Verse 17, And Judah went with Simeon his brother, and they slew the Canaanites that inhabited Zephath, and utterly destroyed it. The name of that city is called Hormah. In all these exploits, you'll notice that Judah is always with Simeon, as I explained earlier. But now they're going to turn their attention to the Philistine cities of Gaza, Ashkelon, and Ekron. There are two more you may want to know, Ashdod and Gath, because the five cities of Philistines will come up a lot as we go forward in this book and the next. But here we're focusing on Gaza, Ashkelon, and Ekron, the cities of the Philistines. 
Verse 18, And Judah took Gaza with the coast thereof, and Ashkelon with the coast thereof, and Ekron with the coast thereof. And the Lord was with Judah and drove out, drove out, I think we would say, the inhabitants of the mountain. But they could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley because they had chariots of iron. Because of the Philistines had a a lot of sea-based trade, that gave them a local monopoly on iron and the use of iron weapons. And because of iron chariots, Israel couldn't defeat them on the level ground, but they could beat them in the mountains. So they succeeded the mountains, just not in the valley. It will, it will uh, happen later on uh, under Samuel, Saul, and David. They will not only have iron, they'll have carburized iron, namely steel. And with that, they will ultimately be successful in subduing the Philistines. That will happen under David. But at this early stage, the Philistines have a, a technological military advantage with their iron chariots. But the key thing is not that technology. The key thing in this military history is that the Lord was with Judah. That's why they won. Verse 20, And they gave Hebron to Caleb, as Moses said, and he expelled thence the three sons of Anak. Verse 21 continues the saga. The children of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites that inhabited Jerusalem. But the Jebusites dwell with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem unto this day. Now the the writer, the penman here, is obviously doing this before David, because David will ultimately drive the Jebusites out and claim the city, and it will be called the city of David. But one of the things we're going to look at shortly is that one of the stages of, of, of the thing falling apart is sparing the enemy. They're not fighting the enemy properly. They're also going to make the mistake of sparing the enemy. You and I have a tough time with that, but let's, let's pay attention as we go. Verse 22, the house of Joseph, they also went up against Bethel. And the Lord was with them. See, Ephraim and the, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, the western half of that tribe, joined together and they took Bethel, which was important to them emotionally because it had a connection with the patriarchs of Genesis. Verse 23, And the house of Joseph went out to decry uh, Bethel, whose name earlier was Luz. And the spies saw a man come forth out of the city, and they said unto him, Show us, we pray thee, the entrance to the city, and we will show thee mercy. And when he showed them the entrance to the city, he, they smote the city with the edge of the sword, but they let the man go and all his family. Here again, it's a episode that's very parallel to the uh, saga of Rahab. Remember the story of Rahab, where the two spies go into Jericho. And Rahab know, has heard about these people. She wants her family saved. And uh, so they give her that commitment. Uh, then when they finally do take Jericho, indeed Rahab and her family were spared. And Rahab marries one of the... Uh, a tribe of Judah by the name of Solomon. And she has a son by the name of Boaz. It becomes very prominent in the book of Ruth. And it's the fields of Boaz and Ruth that uh, we see in the New Testament as the shepherd's fields that uh, close the whole loop there. But anyway, let's move on. Uh, so here's a, a similar situation because in the, tri- the tribe of Joseph there, they found a guy that would uh, give them the military intelligence they needed. There was, there was a secret city into the city. Uh, they typically had those in order so they could get water and so forth. But they found out where it was and used that, obviously exploited that to take the city. And as a result of that, they spared the man. Very straightforward episode. Verse 26, And the man went into the land of Hittites and built a city and called, his name there, called the name thereof Luz, which is the name thereof unto this day. Now we get into section 2. And I'm going to divide these two chapters, one and two, into four parts. The first one is fighting the enemy. This next section, the problem is not fighting the enemy in the direct sense, it's sparing the enemy. This is the second of four stages of failure. Four steps to fail. The first is not to fight properly, the second one is to spare your enemy. Verse 27, Neither did Manasseh drive out the inhabitants of Bethshan and her towns, nor Tanakh and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Dor and her towns, nor the inhabitants of uh, Ablaim and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Megiddo and her towns. But the Canaanites would dwell in that land. And it came to pass when Israel was strong that they put the Canaanites to tribute, but did not utterly drive them out. You may recall that was what God told Joshua to make sure his guys did, to utterly destroy them, wipe them out. But they didn't do that. They spared them. Big mistake. Verse 29. Neither did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites that dwelt in Gezer. 
but the Canaanites dwelt in Gezer among them. Neither did Zebulun drive out the inhabitants of Ketron, or the inhabitants of Nahalal, but the Canaanites dwelt among them and became tributaries. Neither did Asher drive out the inhabitants of Akko, nor the inhabitants of Sidon, or Ahlab, or of Akzib, or Helba, nor of Aphnik, nor of Rehob. But the Asherites dwelt among the Canaanites, and the inhabitants of the land, for they did not drive them out. Neither did Naphtali drive out the inhabitants of Bethshemesh, or the inhabitants of Beth Anath. He dwelt among the Canaanites, inhabitants of the land. Nevertheless, the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh and Beth Anath became tributaries to them. It's a compromise, in other words. They didn't wipe them out, but they made slaves of them. And the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountain, for they would not suffer them to come down to the valley. But the Amorites would dwell in Mount Heres and in Agilon. Now, Agilon is that valley you may recall when we were in Joshua 10, when we were studying the long day of Joshua. The moon was, moon was in, the, in the valley. If you look at the, at the horizon, the mountains, there's a valley. It's like, well, it's like a gun site. The moon was in the valley of Agilon. And from that astronomical data, we learn a great deal of what really did happen there, the long day of Joshua. You can study that in our commentary. I won't digress here. But anyway, the same place. The Amorites would dwell in the Mount Heres and Agilon and the Shalabim, the Yet the hand of the house of Joseph prevailed, so they became tributaries. And the coast of the Amorites was from going up to Akrabim, uh, from the rock and upward. Let's summarize all this. The tribes of Benjamin, Ephraim, Manasseh, Zebulun, Asher, Naphtali, and Dan all failed to overcome the enemy. And they allowed these godless nations to continue living in their tribal territories. The enemy even forced Dan out of the plains into the mountains. The Jebusites remained in Jerusalem, and uh, although they were the Canaanites that lived there were ultimately pressed into forced labor when the Jews became a little stronger. Solomon eventually conscripted these Canaanites to uh, peoples to build the temple, and that was a little compensation for the grief that the Canaanites caused the Jews. But these seri- this series of tribal defeats was the first indication that Israel was no longer walking by faith and trusting God to give them the victory. So that's the root problem. What, what's the really the root problem here? It's pretty direct. It's neglecting the Word of God. You say, Jesus, how do you get that out of here? If you recall, the priests were commanded in the Torah to read the book of Deuteronomy publicly to the nation every sabbatical year during the Feast of Tabernacles. In Deuteronomy chapter 31, they were commanded to read publicly the book of Deuteronomy to the whole nation Every seven years, on a sabbatical year, as the Feast of Tabernacles, that was part of the procedure. And if they had been faithful to their job, the spiritual leaders would have, in that reading, encountered Deuteronomy 7, which warned the Israels not to spare their pagan neighbors. If you read uh, Deuteronomy 7 today, it'll shock you. And in the interest of time, we'll keep moving, but make, put that in your notes. You want to read Deuteronomy 7. Basically, God spends the chapter hammering away that they are not to spare them. They are to utterly wipe out their enemies. They also would have reminded uh, the people when they read to Deuteronomy 31, the first eight verses, God promises to help them defeat their enemies. So God took that upon himself if they're walking with him. By receiving and obeying the book of the law, Joshua had grown in faith. Remember one of your key verses in the book of Joshua. Joshua chapter 1 verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, and then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Key, a key life verse for many of us. That same word would have enabled every succeeding generation to overcome the enemies and then claim their inheritance, but they blew it. And by the way, the same steps towards defeat and slavery to the world are being taken by the church today. Paul warned Timothy about that, Second Timothy. Paul in his letter, second letter to Timothy, chapter 4, verse 3 and 4 says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Fables. 
I'm going to suggest that too many, too many believers today are relying on what I'll call fast food, religious fast food, being dispensed for consumption by entertaining teachers who give the people what they want rather than what they need. Do you hear from the pulpits the blood of Christ being preached? And it's not just the church. Stand back and look at our culture. What is the most absurd, preposterous, fable, conceivable? It's the foundation of our entire culture. Evolution. That this all happened. That there's no evidence of design in ourselves, in our environment. That's crazy. There's no scientific evidence for it, and yet it is the protected myth of our culture. If you're going to prepare for a modern science career, you have to emulate what the Queen told Alice to do. If you're those of you that are fans of Alice through the looking glass, do you remember what the Queen instructed Alice to do? She, <laughs> I'm speaking, of course, of Lewis Carroll's, you know, uh, very, it's not just children's stories. It's, it, if you're a mathematician, it's full of all kinds of things. If, if you ever, if you ever want to get a, if you ever pick up a book, make sure you get what's called an annotated Alice, where it has all the explanation. But anyway, the, the queen instructs Alice. She's shocked that Alice doesn't practice believing impossible things every day. At least a half an hour a day, sometimes six impossible things before breakfast. And you, the whole thing, of course, is facetious, but that's exactly what you've got to do if you're going to be in science. You've got to be able to look at the DNA and, say, and, and ignore the fact that it's a three out of four error-correcting digital code that it operates against language. You're going to have to ignore the evidence of design in every corner of the universe. In fact, it's so obvious in the universe that scientists have given it a name. It's called the anthropic principle. It's as if the universe was designed for man. The ecologists keep pronouncing cosmic doom because we're going to have the ozone on the pole is uh, you know, a tenth of one percent too much. And it's getting worse. Wait a minute. If it's that delicate, who balanced it in the first place? See, all those arguments that it's delicate is an argument against it having happened by accident. Where we see exquisite design every place we look. And on it goes. We could go, we could go on. But the most absurd fable that one can imagine is the underlying premise, not just of our science in high school, but of our law and psychology and, and philosophy. It, it, it's permeated our whole society. We've been here for millions and millions of years. We all came from a rock. You know, first there was nothing, and then it exploded. I mean, you know, some, some of the most articulate teachers against it, of course, guys like Kent Hovind, indulge in, the, in, in riotous humor, because it is laughable. It's crazy. And yet, it's taken so seriously by people who are blinded. Blinded. Well, let's get back to the enemies here. Sparing the enemy, t- sensitive subject. Well, wasn't it cruel and unjust of God to command Israel to exterminate the, the nations of Canaan? Isn't this genocide? Oh, unthinkable. Not so. God had been patient for centuries, withholding his judgment. Genesis 15, 16, 2 Peter 3, 9. It hammers this. Their society, and especially their religion, was unspeakably wicked. That may not offend us as just humans, but it offended the God who deserves and is entitled to be worshipped. It should have been wiped out years before Israel appeared on the scene. Now as we hammer this kind of theme a little bit, I trip and stumble over Thomas Jefferson. He got a great quote. He says, I, Thomas Jefferson said, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just, that his... Uh, Justice will not sleep forever. And by the way, the Canaanite nations had also been warned. How? By judgments of God inflicted on others. They knew what happened in Egypt. They knew what happened to the two nations east of the Jordan. Uh, The kings, Sihon and Og, the Amorites there that were even before they crossed the Jordan. Rahab could read the handwriting on the wall, so to speak. Rahab and her family had sufficient information in order to repent and believe God 
and God saved him. We have every right to conclude that anybody that turned to him would be spared. We see that in Sodom and Gomorrah. They were wiped out. Lot was pulled out of there. But if you read Genesis 19 carefully, the two angels went to Lot, and they not only saved Lot, they point out to Lot, they couldn't do their jobs until he got out of there. It was a prerequisite condition. As long as there was someone there, God would spare him. And we get to Nineveh, in the book of Jonah. The, you know, it, they were 40 days from destruction, and the king on down repented it, within those 40 days, and he did it on spec. Jonah didn't tell him to repent. He was hoping he wouldn't. Jonah went through Nineveh saying, 40 days and you get yours. When they did repent, he pouted a whole chapter of worth. The last chapter of Jonah, he's up sitting under a gourd, upset. I knew you'd spare those people. He had a bad attitude. But the king of Nineveh repented on spec. He had enough information to repent. He did. And what did God do? Give him another century, 100 years more. God did not want the filth of the Canaanite society and their filthy religion to contaminate the people of Israel. You need to really understand that form of worship. It was an agri- uh, agricultural society, dependent desperately on the, the fruitfulness of their crops. And that gave rise to all kinds of fertility cults that involved temple prostitutes. And the false worship of the idols is all mixed up with all kinds of gross immorality. And I won't go through it all. And you can do your homework on what they did, and it's utterly disgusting. All through the Old Testament, you'll hear God doesn't want them to do anything on the high places, because that's where all the pagan stuff was. And they had what they call groves. Those aren't groves of trees. Those are phallic symbols made of trees. It's disgusting. And God did not want His chosen people contaminated with that, because out of his people would come the Messiah. They were his special people. They were his chosen to fulfill his purposes in the world. And he wanted them to be separated from all other nations to bring the world the scriptures and the Savior. G. Campbell Morgan summarizes it pretty well. God is perpetually at war with sin. That's the whole explanation of the extermination of the Canaanites by G. Campbell Morgan. It's tough stuff. You know, as a New Testament reader and with the, the values that we tend from our culture to bring to the readings, we get shocked at, uh, that, at God telling Joshua to wipe out every man, woman, and child of certain tribes. We dis- discover the whole nation is in shambles because they failed to do it. They compromised. Well, we didn't drive them out. We made slaves of them. That's not what God said to do. One of the things that comes through, the more you study your Bible everywhere, in every cook, nook, and cranny, God means what He says and says what He means. He doesn't approximate. He's serious about Himself. He's serious about what He says. He's serious about what He tells us to do. And He holds us accountable to know what He said. When Jesus rode that donkey into Jerusalem, on the very day that 500 years earlier, Gabriel told Daniel the very day. He not only fulfilled that prophecy, he held him accountable. As he rides that donkey over the ridge, read it in Luke 19, as he rides over that ridge, he weeps over the city, oh Jerusalem, Jerusalem, if you'd only known in this your day the things which belong to your peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes. Not forever, Paul tells us they're hidden until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. When the rapture takes place, there's a, the whole thing will change again. But he goes on and he tells them how there's not one stone going to be left up another because you did not recognize the day of your visitation. He held them accountable to know Daniel 9. A million people, some say a million and a half, men, women, and children slaughtered by Titus Vespasian and the four Roman legions for nine months, seal it off, killing them all. He saw it all coming. Why? Why did Jerusalem fall in 70 AD? Because they did not recognize what God had expressly told them in His Word. God takes these things seriously. Now we're going to go through a book that's going to be (laughs) shockingly, shockingly colorful, but very uncomfortable because behind the color and these weird things going on, it's it's an R-rated book. Let me warn you up front. 
we don't have child care anyway at care, but we certainly you don't want kids sitting in the sessions that we're going through. It's uh, pretty strange stuff. So there's some interesting things you can uh, take from this. You should you should do some research on who the Nephilim really were as background. I should have warned you about that part of it. But there's some interesting discussions you can have on the way home as you drive home. Read Deuteronomy 7 and then ask yourself the question, how should that affect the leadership in Israel today? Sharon is trying to take a strong stand and we won't let him. You want to read Benjamin Netanyahu's speech before the Senate a few days ago. It'll be, it's printed in full in the main news journal. Boy, does he lay it down. It's an excellent, excellent piece. We couldn't resist putting the whole thing in there. What should Israel do today to the resident terrorists that uh, in the land? What should they do? You and I might have some opinions, but in Deuteronomy 7 you'll find God's opinions and it will shock you. Well, how's that affect us? Well, that raises a different question. What should we be doing with regards to Israel? Should we be tying their hands? The only democratic partner we have in the entire Middle East? And by the way, their battle is not theirs alone. Unless they defeat terrorism, you're going to have suicide bombers in our major cities. Why not? No, we've got to defeat the very concept of terrorism. We've got to do it absolutely and completely. That makes sense to any thinking person. That certainly is also consistent with exactly what God says in Deuteronomy 7. No, I encourage you to take a careful study of the book of Judges. It's going to be very colorful. Just reading it through will shock you. There are uh, people that believe the Bibles should not be in, in public libraries because of the book of Judges. It is that gross. <laughs> and it is pretty gross. We'll, we'll see as we go. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. God's Word. Well, let's look at the bright side. We do have a king. We do have a king. Israel does not have a king, and the world is going to suffer for it. Not only Israel. But we have a king, and that king is coming to take the crown of David, to take the throne of David. And it's interesting how that all ties together. What we need to do is make sure we're listening to God. We should be plunging continually into God's word. This book of the law shall not depart out of our mouths, but we shall meditate therein day and night. Then we shall have good success. Joshua 1.8 could be our verse as guidance. Let's bow our hearts.